At Guédelon in France, to understand how castles were constructed, they're building one from scratch, using just the tools and materials of the medieval age. It's a 25-year project, the world's biggest archaeological experiment. The most important defensive feature of any castle was the wall surrounding it. Castle walls had to be incredibly thick in order to resist attack and absorb the impact of projectiles fired from trebuchets. The curtain wall was over 20 feet deep, interspersed with towers. In earlier Norman castles, they were square. But while on crusade, European knights saw that eastern towers were round. They realized that eliminating corners not only made them stronger, but also provided a better view of the surrounding landscape. Completing the walls will take some 30,000 tons of sandstone. Transport costs in the Middle Ages were incredibly expensive. So having a good supply of local stone close to the castle was vital. To extract it from the quarry, first a row of holes is hand drilled. Once all the holes are ready, I'm ready to put in the iron wedges and I'm ready to split it open by hitting very hard on each wedge with a big sledgehammer. The stone is split into usable blocks, then transported using horsepower and human effort. This treadwheel crane can lift up to half a ton. The walls are built like sandwiches. On the outside, you have facing walls built from better quality stones. And the inside, the rubble cores, they're built with softer stones and other offcuts from the quarry. And they're built up in layers with a very thick, coarse mortar. This ingenious method makes the walls better able to withstand hits from a trebuchet. Sandstone is too hard to be carved into intricate windows, vaults and steps. Instead, softer, more expensive limestone is used. These sophisticated building techniques make castles the ultimate feats of medieval engineering. It's a testament to their construction that so many still stand today. One weapon more than any other dominated warfare in the Norman period, the crossbow. Fourteenth century crossbows like this were the culmination of centuries of development. With limbs made of steel, they were incredibly powerful. But earlier Norman crossbows had limbs made of wood. There was a limit to how powerful these wooden bows could be. So the idea that Norman crossbows were a powerful weapon is really a myth. Despite this, they were effective at medium range, and that was enough in battle. Drawing the bow repeatedly took a lot of strength. Thankfully, help was at hand. A crossbowman spanned his weapon with a device called a belt and claw. This gave him extra leverage, allowing him to use his back and legs to draw the string. Crossbowmen were vulnerable on a battlefield, so they carried large shields called pavises, so they could hunker down behind, load, pop up, shoot, and then duck back down again to reload. Crossbows were accurate, took less training, and used cheaper ammunition than the longbow. Most importantly, you could wait to take your shot, so they were perfect for siege situations. To protect crossbowmen when they were defending castles, they used specially built wooden galleries called hoardings. But shooting down towards an approaching enemy presented its own problems. 
how to stop the bolt from falling off the crossbow before it could be shot. What they did is just place the thumb loosely on the top of the bolt, which is just enough with light pressure to hold it in place. Around 1200, the Norman wooden crossbow was superseded by a new design, the composite bow. With limbs made from horn and sinew, they could be made more compact than a wooden bow. And they could deliver up to four times the punch. They were, however, more expensive. So whether on the battlefield or the castle rampart, simple wooden crossbows remained the main weapon of the day. By 1100, the medieval knight was dressed from head to toe in mail. Mail is really like a metal fabric. It moves and behaves like a cloth, but it's actually made of hundreds and thousands of interlocking iron rings. It could turn and deflect a sword blade. As an armor, mail didn't work all by itself. It needed the addition of a padded coat The coat absorbed the shock of the blow, whilst the male turned away the cut. Together, they formed an incredibly effective protection. The first stage in making mail was to create wire to the right thickness. To do this, it was pulled through a drawing plate, which had a series of ever smaller holes, until you got wire of the desired gauge. To make the rings, we wind the wire onto a mandrel. And then we take it off the mandrel and cut the rings. So I've flattened the overlapping ends of the ring and I've pierced a hole through it. And now Nick has to put a rivet in it. The basic construction of mail would be a ratio of four to one. So each ring goes through four of its fellows. Here you can see I've made a set of five, which will then be joined to other sets of five to create a sheet of mail. Mail had to be tailored to a perfect fit. It had to be shaped for feet and legs, arms and hands, and of course the head. A skilled mail maker could make very precise shapes. Of course, for more complicated parts of the body, like elbows, we can actually tailor it in two different directions at the same time. Yeah, so if we fold this in half, we have an elbow. One of the main benefits of tailoring in mail was that it meant a knight didn't have to carry a single ring of extra weight that he didn't need to. The mail to cover a knight from head to toe required about 200,000 rings. High-status knights would have had their mail edged with gold, but most importantly, it had to be functional. Clad in mail with his shield and helmet, the knight was well-equipped to face the weapons of the day. Norman domination over England was marked by their imposing castles and new laws. But one passion of theirs also impacted the land, hunting. The Norman nobility, both men and women, shared a love of hunting with birds of prey. To preserve their hunting grounds, they took ownership of the land and outlawed hunting by commoners. Falcons hunt by flying to a great height, then dive bombing their prey. They are kept hunting fit using a lure, a pad of leather with bait attached. This prepared them for catching their prey, usually other birds such as rooks and pheasants. While out hunting, a falcon might give chase to its prey far from the party. So, riders would follow them cross-country on horseback to witness the action. 
after a falcon had caught its prey, it was fed and would not fly again that day. This meant many birds had to be taken on a hunt to keep the nobility entertained. Rather than falcons being carried on horseback, which would jostle them, they were transported on a frame called a cadge. Although falconry was a horseman's sport, hawking was enjoyed on foot. Hawks, unlike falcons, have broad wings and hunt by following their prey in straight flight, often low to the ground through woodland. Hunting by sight, a falcon's vision is highly developed. When not hunting, they were kept calm by putting on a leather hood. The darkness stopped them becoming overstimulated and restless. Lords of the sky, controlled by the lords of the land. Falcons and hawks were symbols of power and status. They were central to Norman identity. A counterweight trebuchet was the king of all siege engines. A catapult capable of smashing down castle walls from great distances. At Warwick Castle in England, they've built a replica, one of the largest in the world. Originating in 7th century China, by the 13th century, trebuchets had evolved into devastatingly powerful weapons. Such a simple design, but so effective. It has several key features. A pivoted arm with a weight at one end and a sling to hold the projectile at the other. To prime, the six-ton weight is raised using tread wheels. So this is one of the wheels, one of two, that's attached to an axle, which would lift the counterweight, weighing six tons. It's based on muscle power alone. What's essential about launching a projectile as far as possible is making sure that this end of the arm is moving as fast as possible. So once that weight drops, it really sends this point of the arm moving at its highest velocity. This was done by positioning the pivot close to the counterweight and by launching the projectile from a sling. When released, the sling whips round, vastly increasing the launch speed. Trebuchets were carefully aimed, like modern guns. In order to weaken the castle walls or even breach them, you had to make sure that the projectiles hit the same spot every single time. For each projectile to follow the same trajectory, they all had to be the same weight and shape. To achieve this, masons used a gauge. Now, I'm going to load this projectile into the sling. Oh, this one must weigh about 25 kilograms, but some projectiles can get up to 150 kilograms. That's the weight of two men. Trebuchets were also used to throw burning tar, beehives, even dead bodies. Anything to cause maximum distress to the enemy. Did you hear that whoosh? It was the counterweight trebuchet's lethal combination of power and accuracy that made it the ultimate medieval siege weapon. People often imagine that castle walls were just left as bare stone, but in fact they weren't. They were plastered, painted and decorated. The process of making medieval paint begins in a quarry. This is a sandstone with a really high iron content. In it, we find pockets of ochre. 
This is iron oxide, like rust, and the ochre is one of the main ingredients in pigment making. First, the ochre is crushed into a fine powder. The finer the particles in paint, the better the paint will be. Once ground up, water is added. Then the mixture is sieved. This is the exact opposite of making pasta at home. At home, when you sieve your pasta, you then keep it for your meal. Here, what's going to end up in the sieve will be discarding. What's needed are the tiny particles suspended in the water. Once it's dry, it's going to look something like this. You can see that all the water has evaporated leaving just this very fine crust, which will then be ground into the fine pigment which is used to make paint. But ochre's colour palette doesn't end there. If it's heated, something magical happens. Yellow ochre turns red. And heating it for even longer, creates a whole spectrum of colours. It's been burnt for over 72 hours at 1,000 degrees Celsius, and that gives us this incredible purple colour. To turn the pigment into paint, it's bound together with egg and tree sap. A popular motif in the Middle Ages was the use of stones and roses. That's where you paint on blocks of stone to make it look like you could afford to pay stonemasons to produce dress blocks of stone and then decorate them with five-petaled flowers. So, medieval castles were far from the gloomy places we imagine today. They were full of colour and light. In the Hundred Years' War, the English used a terror tactic, a raid through enemy territory intended to intimidate and provoke the French into battle. It was called Chevauchet. The principal weapon for Chevauchet was fire. And one of the ways it was delivered was with incendiary arrows. Challenge with incendiary arrows, keeping them alight. One type of incendiary arrow was fueled with gunpowder. We've got charcoal, we've got sulfur, and we've got saltpeter. Saltpeter is the main ingredient. The more oxygen you put into it, the hotter it burns. Of course, when it's on an arrow, when it's being shot, you've got a turbocharged airstream. The chemicals are bound together with brandy, left to dry and poured into a linen bag. The extra long arrowhead is inserted into the bag and then tied off to secure it. It is then sealed by dipping it into boiling tree resin. This resin, which itself is highly flammable, provides a waterproof casing. It also shields the burning gunpowder so the wind doesn't put it out in flight. Now that looks deadly and I really want to shoot it. The art to shooting an incendiary arrow is timing. Too early and it will go out. Too late, it will spit at you like a dragon. That was just evil, <laughs> that was great. The word chevauchet means horse raid, and it was mobile light horsemen who spearheaded the attacks. They took gold and silver from the churches, valuables from wealthy citizens, and as much food and drink as they could find from anyone. A chevauchet was scorched earth warfare to create discontent amongst the enemy's subjects perhaps even to get them to turn against their king. An army on campaign needed a decisive battle. And a chevauchet was intended to taunt the enemy to come out and fight.
the battlefields of the Hundred Years' War were full of danger. To defend against these weapons, a new type of armor was developed. Plate armor. Plate armor clad the knight in an articulating exoskeleton of hardened steel. A hard outer shell that still flexes and moves with the body. It provided impressive protection and was an extraordinary technological achievement. Now, one of the ways that armor gets its strength is through shape. Both of these pieces are made out of the exact same thickness as steel, but I can show you there was one stronger than the other. Here's the one with no shape. You see, it buckles immediately. If I swap it for one that's been forged to have strength and shape, you can see it's much stronger. It's going nowhere. It wasn't just the shape that gave it strength. It was also how the metal was treated by the armorer. Now, the benefits of using heat is that obviously makes the piece more plastic, more ductile, lets me shape it. But the fuel also adds layers of carbon into the outer surface. This helps me increase the hardness and the strength of the material. The art of the armorer was being able to judge the temperature of the metal by eye, managing the heat to create resilience in the metal. The combination of heat-treated metal and rigid shapes meant that armor didn't need to be so thick and heavy making it much easier to fight in. But good quality plate armor did have its downside. It was very expensive. Now, not everyone could afford full steel plate armor. For the common man, there is a brigandine. Now, these are made up of overlapping steel plates that are then riveted through a textile outer. This gives you a much bigger range of movement, but is limited and is not as strong as a full steel breastplate. That said, it is much cheaper and much easier to maintain. At its best, the Armoured Knight was invincible. But armour didn't just provide defence. It was also a weapon and an expression of a knight's power and prestige. Armour transformed its wearer into a work of art. A war horse was no ordinary horse. In battle, it was a knight's comrade in arms. By nature, horses are prey animals, but the war horse had to become a predator. They had to be aggressive and fearless, to charge enemy lines and to trample anyone in their way. To achieve this, they were specially bred and highly trained to fight, to lash out with their hooves on command. This meant war horses were expensive and so conveyed high status. War horses were incredibly strong and powerful, but they were also vulnerable. This is a really big target, and it's much easier to shoot a horse than it is to hit its rider. So just as men wore armor, horses wore armor too. A knight didn't ride his war horse on the road to battle. It was far too valuable. Instead, they were led by the knight's groom. A knight would take multiple war horses on campaign, as he would need to change to a fresh horse several times during battle. Once geared up, the knight his horse and his weapons became a highly effective system. The heavy cavalry lance had a small ring called a graper, and this locks into my arm, forming a hard linkage, so that the lance can't shoot backwards on impact. The war saddle was also crucial. With its high back, it locked the rider to the horse. This means with the graper and the saddle, Horse, man, and weapon are all locked together to create one giant horse-powered projectile. 
the main purpose of heavy cavalry was to charge straight into the enemy and smash through their lines. The impact charge crashed into an enemy with terrifying force. It required horses with exceptional courage and power. Longbows were powerful weapons, but keeping archers supplied with ammunition was a major undertaking. This is a modern arrow. Small and lightweight. Pretty much what everyone shoots these days. Compared to this medieval war arrow. Look at the size of this thing. It's a beast. A medieval army might need more than a million war arrows on campaign, and each one had to be made by hand. It was a labor-intensive business, and the person who did it was called a Fletcher. First, a log is split into square staves. Then the Fletcher uses a plane to start roughing out the shape. Ugh, how do I get it round? Not only have you got to make it round, you've got to make it bobtailed. Look at that. You see that's coming down thinner down that end. There's a natural taper coming down there to that end. A plane with a curved blade is used to create the taper. This makes the arrow aerodynamic. This is an incredibly painstaking process for one arrow. Most of them are just for one shot as well. Next, a slot is cut to receive a piece of horn. The horn reinforces the knock. That's the notch that fits the arrow to the bowstring. Without the horn insert, the power of a heavy war bow could split and shatter an arrow. Once the horn is in place, the knock is sawn and shaped. Then the Fletcher has to attach the feathers to the shaft. Now what you've got to do is you've got to get rid of the stiffness of the quill. You're going to work it down so it's nice and thin. So this is dogfish skin? Yeah, medieval sandpaper. The feathers are glued in place and then secured with thread. The final process is to arm the arrow with its arrowhead. The person who makes these is called an arrowsmith. From a blank piece of iron, he starts with the part that fits over the arrow shaft. First, he makes the bar flat then uses a special former to create a socket. The final stage is to hammer out the shape of the head. Arrow stocks had to be prepared far in advance of a campaign. It was impossible to make them in sufficient numbers overnight. A medieval war arrow like this could only be shot from a big, exceptionally powerful bow. And it packed a mighty punch. medieval army on the march was a city on the move. No expense was spared to keep knights and nobles in the lap of luxury. Knights lived in luxurious tents called pavilions, which had all of their furnishings, proper chairs and tables and tableware, real beds with fine linens, even wall hangings. All this furniture had to be transported, and that's on top of what was needed for combat. Weapons and armor needed an army of artisans to maintain them. The armorer's job on campaign was one of maintenance, constantly repairing, knocking out dents, simply changing straps, or replacing rivets that had broken. If you think of the knight as a race car driver, the armorer is his chief mechanic. Without him, he would not be able to function. Also following an army was a band of opportunistic civilians, the camp followers, all vying to sell their services and goods to the soldiers. When on the march, most of the thousands of soldiers were mounted. Each knight would have at least six horses, all needing grooms, farriers and fodder. 
The royal household brought with them their clerks, their priests, essential for men who feared they might die in battle, and of course, their cooks. The common soldier subsisted mainly on bread and a thick soup called pottage. It was an altogether different story for the knights. A knight on campaign would expect the best food, so we have game, we have fine meats, we have fruit when it's in season, always cooked because food is tied in with health as well, that's very important. And I'm just finishing off a dish here of spiced meatballs with a red wine and pine nut sauce. French and English armies could be on campaign for months on end, manoeuvring and skirmishing until they took to the field for a decisive battle. Medieval soldiers suffered brutal injuries in battle. Their chance of survival lay with barber surgeons. From cutting hair to removing limbs on the battlefield, the job of a barber surgeon was varied, and so were their tools. 600 years ago, surgery was very different from today, and this is some of the kit that the surgeons of then would be using. For example, amputations. This bit of kit was used to cut through the skin. Then you need to get through bone, and this is what they used. Believe it or not, this was used for neurosurgery. But what they didn't have at the time was anesthesia. Despite carrying out major surgery, barber surgeons had no formal training. What they learned, they learned on the job. And the place where they practiced the most was the battlefield. This was also a time when new surgical techniques were developed, particularly when it came to saving the life of a future king. In 1403, 16-year-old Prince Henry was injured in the Battle of Shrewsbury while fighting rebels trying to overthrow his father, King Henry IV. The arrow penetrated his right cheek and became lodged at the base of his skull. He was very lucky it didn't kill him instantly. Prince Henry pulled the arrow from his face. The shaft came out, but the arrowhead remained lodged inside. They needed to get that out before infection set in and killed him. To the rescue, celebrated surgeon John Bradmore. Bradmore recorded what he did to save the prince's life, including a picture of the tool he made to extract the arrowhead. And it works by ensuring that the tip is closed and then inserting it along the track caused by the arrowhead until it meets the arrowhead. Then the screw is turned to expand the tip, locking it in place inside the arrowhead. And then ever so slowly and gently, you extract, making sure that you don't lose it along the way. I'm amazed by the skill that would have been needed to do this successfully. Can you imagine how good that felt when that came out? the young prince survived to become King Henry V, hero of Agincourt. But perhaps the real heroes of medieval medicine were the barber surgeons, who saved countless lives on the battlefield. During the 14th century, the face of war in Europe changed forever. Thanks to a substance invented by the Chinese, while searching for the elixir of life. Gunpowder. One of the first guns used on the battlefields of Europe was this, the Bombard. This is a large stone throwing gun for moving big projectiles like this up and over and through castle walls. Before the invention of the cannon, castle wall-busting projectiles had been thrown by trebuchets. 
this is what took over from the trebuchet. Far easier to move from uh, castle to castle. Its design was simplicity itself, drawing on the skills of the barrel maker. This has metal staves, lengthways, and then lots of hoops holding those staves under compression. So this is why we now call this the gun barrel as well. The bombard was no more powerful than a trebuchet, but it did have a psychological impact on the enemy. If we take it back several hundred years and the loudest thing is a cockerel crowing or a brawl in the pub on a Saturday night, these things are horrendously frightening. As metallurgy improved, barrels could be made longer, increasing accuracy and power. They progressed from taking down walls to taking out soldiers replacing the bow and arrow. A typical arrow would get stuck in this sort of material where ball just goes straight through. So compared to a bow and arrow, this is far more deadly. During the Hundred Years War, there was even a precursor to the machine gun, the Ribaldequin. She's got several barrels on her. This is the sort of gun that would have been very much against people being able to spread your shot out and hit large numbers of people in one go. Gunpowder revolutionized warfare throughout the Hundred Years' War. changing the way battles were fought forever. Before the invention of printing in the 15th century, books were painstakingly copied by hand. The finest were illuminated with brilliant colors and real gold. Illuminated text wasn't just for show. Gilded illustrations decorated important passages to highlight their significance. Gold was used in many medieval manuscripts from early days because it was very expensive and it indicated that the manuscript itself was valuable. The light would reflect from candles or from the sunlight and so it looked as though the book itself was illuminated. In medieval manuscripts, it looks as though this is solid gold. In fact, it's not. The gold itself is tissue thin. The solid appearance is achieved by laying the gold on a cushion of plaster mixed with glue, called gesso. By raising the gold from the surface of the skin, that means that it catches the light even more. The glue in the gesso is softened by breathing on it. We then have three seconds to get the gold on, and I'm using a burnisher, which is a polished stone, just to make sure that the gold sticks then the burnisher is used to polish the gold up. See, it's coming up now. So it's coming nice and shiny. Next, the miniature is painted. The base color will be done first. Then the tints and the shades will be added. And finally, the white highlights and the outline, which lifts it and brings the whole thing to life. The medieval paint box contained pigments from across the world such as ultramarine from Afghanistan and orpiment gathered from volcanic craters. It often took a long time to complete these medieval miniatures. This one between a month and six weeks from start to finish.
An entire book could take a team of illuminators several years to complete. Many medieval manuscripts still survive today, fully preserved, with their colors just as vivid as the day they were illustrated. and confusion of battle, communications were vital. One solution was the use of message arrows. Signal arrows could be used to send messages to your drone troops. Faster than a man, faster than a horse. It was the quickest way to communicate in the heat of battle. Whistling arrows were blunt, and most importantly, they announced their arrival. But they weren't just used to pass written messages. When shot in a volley, whistling arrows could be loud enough to signal to a small group of warriors, telling them both where and when to attack. On hearing the sound, they would gallop in and strike where the arrows landed. However, a much louder sound was required to sound the retreat or to communicate to the whole army. That was the job of the war drums. Mongols also used gongs, and the combinations of drums and gongs gave the Mongols a wide array of signaling options. We do not know the exact rhythms they used, but basic commands could be conveyed with different percussive patterns. They enabled the Mongols to communicate with their own forces and strike fear into the enemy. They were the heartbeat of the Mongol army. The Mongol Empire was one of the largest the world had ever known. This couldn't have been achieved without the hardiness and endurance of the Mongol horse. The Mongol horse was the empire's main mode of transport. From the extreme heat of the Gobi Desert to the harsh sub-zero temperatures of Eastern Europe, it had to be adaptable to any type of condition. Professor Del Jaborjan is an expert on this breed. The Mongolian staff is very cold in winter and very hot in summer. So Mongolian horse has very thick coat and long hair and very hard hoofs. Left untrimmed and unshod, their hooves are perfect for crossing all types of terrain. And by feeding themselves on what was naturally available from the land, the army was freed from carrying additional fodder on campaign. In winter, it can uh, pour off the snow and eat the grass underneath. But it wasn't just their versatility that made them invaluable. It was also their ability to travel great distances quickly, made possible by a unique fifth gate. The fifth gate is an energy-efficient pace that enables the Mongol horse to travel at a steady speed for long periods of time. And the running style is almost bounce-free, meaning a warrior could endure longer rides and even sleep whilst on the move. Today's Mongolian crossbreeds still have this ability. But like any horse, carrying a person at speed couldn't be kept up indefinitely. This meant that before the horse became tired, the rider could switch to a fresh one. When they train the horse, they just change it on the move from one saddle to another saddle. By repeatedly switching horses, a mounted warrior could travel vast distances much faster than conventional armies. With their speed, adaptability and endurance, the Mongol horse was the engine that drove the Mongol army to victory. 
the Mongols were famed for their archers. And at the heart of their success was the clever engineering of the Mongol bow. The Mongol bow was part of a family of bows. Different cultures made these in varying shapes, but they were all made of the same materials. They were all composite bows, assembled from several parts. Lucas Novotny is a world-class horse archer and a master composite bow maker. Here we have a wooden core. That's what we begin with. The core is basically the invisible part of the bow. All we see in a bow is always the flesh. However, we never see the skeleton. Just like in a human, we know it's there. The wooden parts are fitted together with precision joints, giving the bow its distinctive shape. Okay. Now, we have the tips. They go in like so. These tips of the bow are non-bending. They act as levers that allow you to draw a much stronger bow than you normally would be able to. It's a genius bit of engineering. The next stage in assembling the composite materials is to laminate the wooden core with strips of horn. A tool called a tendiac ensures that even pressure is applied to the glued surfaces. That's, that's a lot of pressure. I have to work to really kind of keep this in place. Horn resists compression and stores energy. It is the muscles of the bow. The bow maker then applies the sinew. This is dried animal tendons that have been pounded and shredded to produce fine fibers of considerable tensile strength. Bundles of combed sinew are moistened with water, then soaked in glue made from the swim bladders of fish. The sinew is applied carefully, layer by layer. One medieval text states that all of the skill lies in the laying of the sinew. You have to really be quick with your hands. You have to make sure the fibers are straight. Keeping the sinew straight is essential. If the limbs are not perfectly true, the bow risks twisting in action. A Finnish Mongol bow is usually covered with leather or birch bark to protect it from the elements. But the horn is exposed. That is where the power is. In the hands of highly skilled mobile horse archers, the Mongol bow became one of the most legendary weapons in history. The vast Mongol Empire was created by warfare, but it was governed by bureaucracy. Good communications across the empire were vital. And that was the job of the Yam Riders. The Yam was an incredibly well-organized postal system, introduced by Genghis Khan over 800 years ago. It consisted of a network of relay stations, linked by high-speed riders. These riders were so fast, they were known as the arrow messengers. You know, they rode at such a bruising pace that they would have to use these cloths to support their abdomen, their spine, and their internal organs. Yam messengers wore a sash of bells so they could be heard approaching from a distance. With this advance warning, a fresh relay horse could be ready as soon as they arrived. Remounting like this allows us to travel several relays each day. With a constant stream of riders, official messages could be carried quickly to and from all corners of the empire. In China alone, the Yam had over 14,000 relay depots and over 50,000 horses. In some areas, the relay stations were much closer together. Here, the system also used fast runners. However, it was the hard-riding couriers that made the Yam such a rapid communications web. And to ensure it ran smoothly, 
riders carried a medallion, the Paisa. Paisas acted as passports and gave the owner authority to demand goods and services from the yam stations and the local population. The yam messengers were the lifeblood that flowed through the great Mongol Empire. Nomads followed their flocks and herds. A Mongol family might move up to 30 times a year to seek fresh grazing. Nomadic people civilization is different from the settled uh, civilization. It's based on open field movement and horseback riding lifestyle. The music is uh, one of the most important elements of this kind of way of life. A central theme in Mongolian music is the horse. All Mongol life was lived on horses. That's part of the, the Mongol identity, is the music of the horse. The most iconic Mongolian instrument was the Morin Khor. Morin Khor in a Mongolian language, it means horse head fiddle. The strings came from a horse's tail, 120 hairs for the top, female string, and 150 for the bottom, male string. Everything to do with the Morin Corps related to horses, and it could even imitate their sounds. A distinctive aspect of Mongolian music is throat singing. Throat singing is an ancient way of singing that imitates the echo from the nature. Throat singing is the sound of the step, the wind, the earth, the animals. Music was also used to tell stories. In this praise song, two horses run away from Genghis Khan for a life in the wild. But they miss his kindness, and so they return. The prospect of being immortalized in a praise song was a powerful motivation for warriors on the battlefield. The Mongols used all manner of ingenious machines, from trebuchets to giant crossbows. They were masters of siege warfare and recruited Chinese military engineers to build their devices. In this copy of an 11th century Chinese manual, Justin Ma has discovered an unusual weapon. This is a triple crossbow, a large triple crossbow um, in an arrangement where we have two bows in front. And, and here's the weird thing. You've got one bow in the back facing backwards. There is a term in this passage which says that the bows are joined using a shengzhou, Mm -hmm. or a rope and axle, oh, a pulley. Okay, yeah. A pulley is the key, and that's the absolute essential ingredient in this contraption to make it work. The front bows are joined by two simple cords. However, the rear bow is set facing backwards. The front two bows are strung and set to face forwards. The rear bow is then connected to the front bows by a single cord, running through two pulleys. This pulley system allows all three bows to thrust a projectile in the same direction. Now these pulleys make sense. Sort of spanning around here, reversing the direction. A winding mechanism called a windlass draws the string into place. You can see that tension as it's pulling that last bow in reverse. 
A crucial part of the design is the backwards-facing bow. This unique feature gives the machine a huge draw, making it capable of shooting massive darts. There's a lot of tension in there. The projectile strikes with impressive force. Golly. Well, it's gone through three. Piercing three boards on the first attempt, the team decides to increase the challenge. Let's do it. Quite exciting. Let's see if it really can punch a hole through that fourth one. It went all through three of them, and it punched a slight hole on the side of the fourth. In battle, such weapons might be used to penetrate shields, but this heavy oak barrel poses an even greater challenge. Aha, we got the hole. <laughs> Look at it. A lot of leaking out. I didn't think we are going to be able to punch this. I mean, it's just incredible. This is impressive. I mean, this took a lot of force, too. Look at the thickness of it. And this is some hard wood. I mean, this is not just some particle board here. OK? <laughs> I mean, this is incredible. Embracing the knowledge and skills of the people they conquered enabled the Mongols to win wars and control vast territories. This was key to the creation of one of the world's largest empires. Heavy cavalry was an integral part of the Mongol army. By definition, they were fully armored. Heavy cavalrymen were troops who went into the thick of the fighting. Mongol heavy cavalry had steel helmets, but they also had this very distinctive form of armor here, known as lamina, made of steel, rawhide, and even leather. Now, in this example, you can see how the individual scales have been laced together often with doe skin, rows of lamellite, which in turn was then sewn into fabric or leather backing. Lamina armor is wonderfully robust. It's flexible, relatively lightweight, and easy to repair. The Mongol heavy cavalryman in his characteristic lamina armor was the hammer in the Mongol war machine. All Mongols, both heavy and light cavalry, were capable horse archers. However, for the heavy cavalry, shock troops that rode into and smashed the enemy, the bow was of secondary importance. Their principal weapon of first contact was the lance. Using the momentum of the horse, the lance was mostly used point first to strike and pierce a foe. It could be used with great precision. Strikes with the point were effective, but the Mongol lance had an additional feature. Not only did you have the spearhead for running into and through the enemy, but you also had this hook to haul them from the saddle. It took considerable strength to pull a man from his horse. And doing so took him out of the fighting just as successfully as a head-on strike. In hand-to-hand -hand combat, the Mongols used the sword to slice their way to victory. But they also had this, the great mace, which they used with two hands. <laughs> Mongol armies were famous for their ability to move fast and strike with surprise but their heavy cavalry was a brutal shock force that could overwhelm and crush an enemy with raw power. Horse archers were elite troops who galloped into battle, shooting their bows from the saddle Arrow after arrow after arrow. The key to horse archery is being able to fit an arrow to the string, draw it back, and release very, very quickly. 
horse archers use a special device called a thumb ring. And this gives us a special technique to lock the arrow onto the bow and shoot. With the thumb draw, the arrow is placed on the right-hand side of the bow. And so taking an arrow from the quiver and onto the string was extremely efficient, allowing horse archers to shoot in rapid succession. The three main shots are the forward shot, the side shot, and the back shot, also called the Parthian shot. Both Moscow and the Mongols had a horse archery tradition that stretched back for centuries. Their armies were well matched with these light and versatile troops, and their conflicts were characterized by the horse archer's fluid style of warfare. Horse archers were famed for their surprise attacks. In Moscow's armies, they could be deployed rapidly in many different terrains, and then appear as if from nowhere. In addition to being expert with their bows, they used both javelins and swords for close quarter fighting. Attacks could come from any side, so horse archers had to shoot both left and right-handed. Shots taken behind the head offered additional variety in the angles of attack. They were also expert at swarming across an enemy's front to decimate his lines. They were quick to retreat and just as quick to renew their attacks. Horse archers were Moscow's crack troops. They patrolled the borders and held them against invaders. Muscovy was shielded by vast forests, which slowed the advance of approaching enemies. These woodlands were also an abundant source of timber for building wooden forts. Forts built within urban settlements were called Kremlins. The original Kremlin in Moscow, from at least the 12th century, was made entirely from wood, as were all buildings in the city. To understand how these forts were constructed, a scaled-down version is being made. Moscow built forts in vast numbers. You can see they had an ingenious way of doing it. These standard lengths of wood have V-shaped notches cut into the end, and then they can be simply overlaid into a box construction which forms a cell. No joints, no nails, just the sheer weight will keep them in place. Stacked together both vertically and side by side, these cells created astonishingly resilient walls. They were far better at withstanding attacks from mighty siege engines than simple vertical palisades. And the box construction of Muscovy forts also had a number of other advantages. By filling them with earth or with stone, it made them not only stronger than a single wooden palisade, but it also gave them sturdiness and elasticity, which could better absorb the impact of projectiles from trebuchets. And the other advantage of these box structures is that they could be prefabricated. Now, the first step in that process is taking off the bark. This stops wood-eating insects from sheltering beneath the bark and allows the wood to dry, preventing it from rotting. By taking off the bark, this wood will then last for years. Prepared timbers could be stored and then assembled into cells, wherever and whenever needed. And some cells, both on the walls and the gatehouse towers, were not filled with earth. Instead, they were left empty for defenders to use. From the 13th century, some towers were made of stone and brick, like this one at Chertsk Castle, built in 1388. 
When stone wasn't available locally, red brick was the material of choice. Of course, the advantage of using bricks is that they're easy and cheap to manufacture. They're uniform, so easy to build with. And it's these red bricks which give the distinctive look to Eastern European castles, which we can still see to this day. Stone and brick towers could be built much taller than wooden ones. This allowed Moscow's defenders to spot potential attackers sooner, keeping their enemies at bay. The might of medieval Moscow was powered by strong arms and an unbreakable fighting spirit. Fighting with a sword and shield, eye to eye in a gritty and brutal contest was the European way. Swords in Moscow developed along the same lines as they did in Western Europe. This is a typical sword of around 1400. It's got a broad double-edged blade, a simple cross guard, and this heavy pommel counterbalances the blade. They were so well balanced that these powerful medieval swords were capable of being wielded with great speed and fluidity. By the 14th century, improvements in the manufacture of iron made it possible to fashion swords with longer blades. And swords like this, requiring two hands to wield, became more and more common on the battlefield. They were called long swords, and they were used with sophisticated martial techniques. It does have incredible and terrifying power. But there was another influence on Moscow. Moscow traded with the East, and Moscow fought with the East. And it was from the East that Moscow adopted the saber with its distinctively curved blade. The curve on a saber blade gives a natural slice to the cut, so cutting deeper for less effort. These exceptionally light swords were first and foremost a horseman's weapon. As a single strike weapon, using the speed of the horse for impact, it was one cut onto the next. But cutting wasn't their only use. Even with a curved blade, you can still deliver an effective thrust. However, for all their cavalry dash, the old ways of standing firm remained part of the Muscovy way. Forging a military culture that was a unique blend of West and East. Among both the armies of Moscow and the Golden Horde were strange-looking creatures. Grotesque, sinister faces that struck terror into a foe. There's a very long history of making helmets with mask visors with human features in the ancient Near East. Moscow was heavily influenced by this metalworking tradition, using the art of embossing to hammer these extraordinary sculptural forms into the steel. To make these masks required highly skilled artisans. In present-day Poland, Adam Mazia is a master of the craft. The process begins with a thick, flat sheet of wrought iron. The hammer stretches and domes the plate, the beginnings of a face. As the metal is pushed out, it becomes thinner and so easier to work. Adam marks a center point and an outline of the nose. This is the only guide he uses. All else is done by eye alone. In Western Europe during the late Middle Ages, helmet design was all about function. What shapes are going to form glancing surfaces that make weapons skate and bounce away from the face? In Moscow, however, the approach was rather different. They sacrificed quite a lot of protection for the sake of extraordinary visual impact. There is a limit to which the metal can be stretched, and so a slot is cut to allow the nose to be shaped. Released from the bonds of the rigid plate, 
the nose takes on its distinctive form. In a way, armor is always a mask. It forces the world to see us as we want to be seen. Strong, powerful, indomitable. These Muscovite mask visors are an extraordinary example of that projection of identity. In some cases, they were actually made as portraits in the image of the wearer. With every strike, the features become more and more recognizably human. The furnace imbues the mask with a warrior's fury. When finished, the visor is given a high polish and attached to its helmet with this rotating hinge that allows the visor to be raised and stowed when not in use. But it can always be quickly lowered as soon as danger threatens. A man could project his power with such a mask. A man could hide his fear with such a mask. And by doing so, he could be brave. From long, harsh winters, to Mongol invasions, life for Muscovite peasants was tough. But they had one crop that was vital to their survival, rye. Moscow peasants relied on cereal crops more than any other food. To separate the grain from the straw, cereals had to be threshed with a flail. This tool could also be repurposed for battle. When the Grand Prince called upon peasants to serve in the army, they would have become armed with their tools of the trade, their pitchforks and their pikes, but chief amongst their weapons would be the flail. Farming crops in a land that was covered in snow for six months of the year was challenging. But rye was one crop that was particularly adapted to the extreme Moscow climate. The thing about rye is it's incredibly hardy. If you can sow it in autumn, it'll grow through the winter months, even with a covering of snow on the ground. Now, Russia is famous for its long, cold winters, but it also gets very hot and dry summers, and it's in those drought conditions that rye also thrives. And it's for that reason that a majority of Moscow peasants were growing this stuff. But they didn't get to keep all of their crop. The largest rye grains were given to the Grand Princes as tax while the rest would be used to make bread or malted to make a nourishing, non-alcoholic drink, kvass. It's super easy to make and, yeah. and, and cheap, really cheap. It's great for helping tired muscles recover and it's just quite refreshing and also helps control infections. Muscovite soldiers drank kvass as part of their daily rations. It's made by first adding ground malted rye to boiling water. After cooling, yeast culture is added, causing the mixture to ferment. This kills off any germs in the water. There you go. Around three days later, the kvass is ready to drink. The bubbles are really starting to come up now. Yeah. Just the yeast doing its work. What are the special qualities of this drink, then? It's essentially a probiotic drink. It has a lot of B vitamins, and it has lactic acid, which is great for recovering from hard labor. It's, it's kind of an ideal sports drink, really. And with rye so easy to grow, you can see how this was the sort of savior, if you like, of the, of the Moscow peasantry. The hardiness and versatility of rye was a lifesaver to Muscovites, both for peasants at home and soldiers on campaign. Streltsy is the Russian word for shooters. And from the late 15th century, the armies of Moscow had included regular troops. Armed with an arquebus, a standard firearm in all European armies at the time. This is an arquebus. It's an early type of musket. To load it, you put a charge of black powder down the barrel. The ammunition is a lead ball. A paper wad seals the charge. Then both ball and wad are rammed home tight. 
To shoot the gun, priming powder is placed in the pan. The priming is lit by a match. Now, a match was originally a length of cord soaked in saltpeter so that it burns slowly but continuously, and even in poor weather. When lit, this sends a flame through a small hole at the base of the barrel, which lights the main charge. One of the great advantages of the arquebus was that the ammunition was inexpensive and easy to make. Molten lead was poured into a special mold. It cooled to a solid state in seconds, making it possible for vast quantities of lead balls to be produced. They were finished by trimming off the excess lead, which was known as a sprue. Strelsi received regular payment of both money and bread, and they lived with their families in purpose-built settlements called Slobody. Streltsy were a new type of army, ordinary troops recruited from tradespeople and farm workers. An early arquebus had an extremely heavy barrel. To shoot it with accuracy, the gun had to be steadied, and Streltsy had a unique solution. This is a type of axe called a bardiche, and for the Streltsy, it doubled as a gun rest. Arquebus men were usually vulnerable to cavalry. Even with experience, reloading takes time. And cavalry covers ground very speedily. Once you've shot, your position becomes perilous very, very quickly. However, with the scything power of a Bardiche, a Strelsi has at least the chance to withstand a cavalry onslaught. It took a brave cavalryman to ride into a hail of bullets but an even braver one to face the horror of these axes. Over time, Moscow's armies recruited more and more men armed with guns. Inexpensive troops who changed the way war was waged.